Good evening, everyone. It's uh, uh, Tuesday, 4th of May, uh, 2021 at 630. And I'd like to welcome everyone to the uh, regular Finance and Personnel Committee meeting for the Village of North Hudson. Those of you that might be on here waiting for the regular board meeting, that will start at 7 o'clock. So if you got something better to do or you want to listen in, you go right ahead. This should be quick. Uh, roll call, please. Trustees Nelson. Here. Pike. Here. President Wecken. Here. Trustees Ice. Here. Thank you. Is there a, a CDRC? We have number two is minutes. Regular Finance Personnel Committee meeting from 30 March 2021. Is there a motion or Stand, a second? I move to approve the minutes. Thank you, Kirk. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Brian. Is there any amendments, corrections, or additions to the minutes? Hearing none. Everyone in favor of the minutes as presented. And, and well done, Jessica. Signal I was saying aye. All right. All right. All right. Opposed? Thank you. Next item three is claims and review <clears throat> recommendations. Uh, is there a motion? Stan, can I move to approve the May 4th non recurring claims of $54,025.08? Thank you, Kirk. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Tim. Uh, is there a discussion? Questions? Um, Melissa, who is Clifton Larson Allen? They are, uh, they do our audit. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Thanks. And they're, they're doing that right now. So that's why we have some bills from them. Okay. Thanks. Ready. And uh, anything else? Hearing none. Uh, let's see. That better be a roll call vote. Uh, Tim? Yes. Kirk? Yes. Brian? Yes. And I'll say yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Item uh, 2021, item four, street maintenance discussion, possible recommendations. Is there a motion? Stan, I recommend to rent the spray patch trailer from RCM Equipment. Also to purchase trap rock and oil, possibly from another vendor to be be determined at a later date, costs not to exceed 30000 and to be paid for from the hot patch, spray patch, street maintenance account. Thank you, Brian. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Kirk. Uh, discussion. Brian, you want to? Um, Patrick, yeah, you want to explain or, what oh, you're Pat doing? Oh, here, too. Um, yeah, I can talk about it. Um, so what I did is I got a... Um, I apologize for not having that on the website, but um, we discussed it, I guess, at length in our public works meeting. Um, we can we can rent this spray patch machine. Um, it's sixty five hundred dollars, and that's for a whole month uh, to be twenty eight days. Um, and then uh, we can either buy the trap rock through this said company and the oil. Um, I also did some investigating. We can probably get the oil in the trap rock a little bit cheaper from other places. So um, I would like to try it. I don't, I honestly can't tell you if it's going to save any money. Not yet. I hope to, um, but that's my, that's my plan and we'll try it. And if it works, it works. And if it doesn't, we'll know better next year. No, I like that. You might be able to get more distance, uh, or more stuff done when you get a whole month rather than just the one day that uh, the county come in. Yeah. Yeah. And that was kind of my thought too, is because we kind of have to work around their schedule and um, this way it would be right here. If something came up, if we had a hole that we needed to patch the machines right here um, and we can just go through and do the whole dang village all at once and, and then be done with it and done for the year. No, that sounds good. I think it's a, I think it's a good, uh, good, a good uh, effort. So, Thank Patrick, you. you're not to exceed thirty thousand. So, I'm assuming how many months you plan on renting this? I apologize well, if I'm I, not re reading that. Just, <laughs> just one. Um, the reason why I put that in there is because that's what that's what's budgeted in that account. I don't know that I'll. I hope that I don't spend all that. That's not what I'm after. 
Um, I just wanted to have the option because I'll have to, I'm still investigating on where to get the best price for the oil and the rock. And that'll, sure. that'll, you know, add mm-hmm. on a little bit, but I also wanted to say that um, I included in public works that for the County it's $4,500 per day. Yeah, that, that machine, seems, so. that certainly seems, uh, that's why I understand the $30,000. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Good. Anything else? Uh, hearing none, uh, this is a roll call vote for spending. Brian? Yes. Kirk? Yes. Tim? Yes. And I'll say yes also. Thank you. Uh, and item five is Bobcat trade in and purchase of attachments, discussion, possible recommendation. Motion. Then I move to recommend a skid loader trade in and upgrade with Fabic Caterpillar with cost not to exceed 14700 funding to come from Public Works Capital Equipment Fund. Thank you, Brian. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Kirk. Discussion. Mm-hmm. Do, is this the one that we were dealing with tires and all that stuff initially at one point? And... Yeah, we have in the past. Um, they, they go through tires because we use them so much on the street, uh, you know, do a lot right. of roading from place to place. And this actually trade is going to be a brand new one then, this Fab Cat? Fabic Cat? Yep, either one. It's uh, Fabic Cat. Yep, oh, Fabic they're no color. Okay. It's still, a, it's still a wheel machine, not a tread, right? Yeah, no tracks. Not, not for us. Okay. Yeah, that'd be a lot of loading and unloading. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, no, that's not. I wish I wish we could. They're they're uh, they're nicer for grading and stuff, but we just it it just wouldn't work. Well, that's what I thought. Okay, anything else? Hearing none. Uh, spending again, Tim. Yes. Kirk. Yes. Brian. Yes. And I'll also say yes. Thank you. Uh, item six, uh, Buckthorn Invasive Weed Control Discussion and Possible Recommendations. Is there a motion? Stan, I recommend to purchase livestock fencing and materials with funding to come from Park Development Fund and price not to exceed 1400 Thank you. Brian, is there a second? A second that. Thanks, Tim. Uh, discussion, uh, Patrick. Um, yeah. So I looked up um, livestock fencing. Uh, kind of figured about how much fencing we're going to need. So I, um, I'd like to. The most reasonable place to get that is actually Amazon. So um, we'll do that, and then we need a a good solar charger and a good battery, and uh, and then hopefully next month I'll bring. The rest of it to you. Just kind of want you know to get what? all the equipment and get it, get a spot and get it ready. In so a way to month. lock them to a tree or something, so yeah. they don't walk away. What's that? Get a lock so that the that the uh, charger and the and the uh, battery don't suddenly disappear in the, under the cover of darkness. Oh no! I plan on putting that in some type of a box that'll be locked. All right, that's so good. That's kind of what I thought. This is the uh, first step of us trying to feel it. Uh, if we could get our parks more expanded and get rid of this buckthorn, we're really hoping that after we start this and it does work, that we could do this to all of our parks. Well, that would be wonderful. I mean, uh, it's a it's an uh, environmentally friendly way to go. I guess that's not you know so, and I believe they've tried it uh, down south of us uh, in a local city that's torn up like we are. Okay. Uh, any other discussion? Hearing none. Uh, oh. Let's see. Uh, Brian? Yes. Kirk? Yes. Tim? Yes. And I'll also say yes. And I would like to declare this meeting adjourned at 639. We'll see you in 20 minutes. Well, according to the clock on this iPad, it says 7 o'clock. And I'd like to call the Village of North Hudson Regular Board of Trustees meeting to order on Tuesday, May 4th 
at 7 p.m. This is a vir virtual meeting. What's that? Let's go ahead, Stan. It's just... Go ahead, Stan. Somebody in the somebody I don't see is talking, and I can't hear him or see him. Yeah, no, Ben. Just, ben was talking. You can. You oh, can go okay. ahead. Okay. Uh, all right. And uh, since we've had call the order, I'm going to read uh, a quick uh, invocation. This is uh, thank you, Father, for those times when our nation has recognized her need for your guidance. May our leaders today understand that our greatness comes only because of your mercy and grace. Roll call, please. Trustees Matz. Here. McGurvin. Uh, absent. Nelson. Here. Noonan. Uh, Pike. See her. Here. Noonan said yes. She just has herself muted. Okay. <laughs> President Wecken. Uh, here. And Trustee Zeiss. Here. Thank you. Item two is review and approve minutes from the regular board meeting of 30 March uh, 2021 and the reorg meeting of 20 April 2021. Is there uh, a motion? Move to approve. Thank and you, I'll Brian. second. In our second. Thank you, Tim. Uh, any amendments, corrections, or additions to the minutes? Hearing none, all in favor of the minutes as presented, signal by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. Item three is comments from the floor. That's an opportunity for residents to make the board aware of topics, issues, uh, and opportunities either on or not on today's agenda. You can bring up the topics, but we're not allowed to discuss them until they are actually on the agenda. So is there anyone here with uh, comments from the floor? Hearing none. Ooh. Okay, hearing none, we'll go on to item four, presentation for years of dedicated service. Stan, Stan. What? That's right. Did we, did we vote on that? The minutes? Yes, we, yes, we did. Okay. I believe. All Sorry. in favor was, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, and actually, uh, technically, I think according to the rules, uh, we don't really need a motion on minutes, but. Right. We, we've been doing it since I've been doing it, so okay. we'll stay with that. Okay, now, item four. Presentation for years of dedicated service to the Honorable Judge Ben Wopat. And I see Ben is with us tonight, and he had just, as some of you might not know, he just recently retired uh, uh, from the uh, Municipal Court, where he's been here since 1985, until present date. So we have uh, 36 years of municipal service that the judge had uh, donated, or not donated, but it served our, our uh, village. And prior to that, he also served two different uh, terms appointed to as, as the board of trustees. So he's more than very familiar with how everything works around here. And we have bought him, uh, we would ordinarily have a photo op at the hall if we were still meeting there and uh, i would like to shake ben's hand but i can't do that over you know over the air so uh we we have uh melissa has a a token that she would like to show we have uh uh it uh it, it the box says an appreciation for your years of dedication to the village of north hudson and inside the uh Magic box is a, a pocket watch that says Honorable Ben A. Wolpat, Village of North Hudson, 1985 to 2021. And I would uh, like to have a big round of applause for Ben and for the uh, uh, great job he's done for us over the years, and he will truly be missed. Ben, would you like to say anything? I would just like to express my appreciation to the uh, to the board, the uh, police chief, and the former police chief, Rich Jansen, who was the individual that first uh, encouraged me to run for the office, and I thought it was a good opportunity to use my um, law degree 
It's something that might benefit to the village. And uh, it's been an interesting 36 years, probably not as stressful as six years as chairman of the uh, Pepper Festival. (laughs) 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 It it did present some interesting cases, and um, I think uh, it was time to move on. And I'm glad that uh, you have a person who's filling the um, position that has some legal education and hopefully will be able to carry on as effectively as we have in the past 36 years. Well, well, thank you very much, Ben. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure working with you and, uh, and having you in the community. I know that yeah, you've done uh, all kinds of years of public service and it's much appreciated. So I, it, I trust you'll have a long and happy uh, retirement. I hope so also. Thank you, Stan. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you. All right. Thank Thank you. you. Um, Let's see. Item five. Exception to the noise ordinance during Highway 35 project. Discussion possible approval. Is there a motion? Uh, I don't have it up yet. Brian, you have it up? Yeah. Um, Whereas a major construction project involving Highway 35 will be occurring in the village's construction season, and whereas Highway 35 is the major thoroughfare through the village and project, and the project will have a significant impact on access for the public as well as impacts to fire, police, EMS, utilities, garbage, postal service in the village, the board finds it necessary to protect the health, safety, and welfare on the residents of the residents of the village to move to temporarily suspend the prohibition on construction work during certain quiet hours as set forth in section 70-6 parentheses D to allow construction to proceed on a highway 35 project outside of the restricted hours. This suspension relates only to the highway 35 project. Thank you, Brian. Is there a second? A second. Thank you, Tim. Discussion. I would have to guess there would be so. I believe we have somebody from the contractor on the call, too. Yeah, so, this is Barry. Hi, Barry. Good evening, Barry. My one concern is that it feels like, uh, as I mentioned to Paul and Melissa earlier today, I, I was wondering if, if uh, we really should somehow put this in a public uh, hearing type of session so the public has a chance at least the folks on 35 i would think would want a chance to weigh in um can i clarify what we're asking on this yeah yes, sir. that would be yep. wonderful so right now the hours of restriction are 7 a.m to 7 p.m monday through friday saturdays sundays um what we're asking for um the contract was executed three and a half weeks later than it should have been and with material stuff and pouring concrete on the schedule is supposed to be completed in November. Well, the last three years, we've had freezing temperatures in mid to end of October that have shut us down. Um, there's two things. One is we'd like to be able to work till nine o'clock at night or at least until, you know, half hour before sunset, you know, to get the most out of the day. Um, the other thing that we request is that when we are paving the pavement on the new highway, highway connecting road that our saws later in the year or in the summer, depending on temperatures, are able to go out there and saw the concrete when it's uh, at its opportune time, you know, to prevent unforeseen cracking. Um, It's customary that, you know, we watch the temperature, the moisture, and figure out when we can get on it to set early concrete cutting to eliminate the uh, cracking that can happen if it cures too fast. So it's two parts to what we're looking at. One is a two hour from the seven to nine. And the other is, you know, when we're pouring the concrete is being able to cut at night. So that Barry, that second part, go ahead, Mark. Sorry. One, one comment. That second part could exceed past midnight. I'm assuming, right. It could be throughout the, uh, the evening it into could, the morning. And it could in July because of the temperatures, you right. know, you might be able, you know, if you pour till six, seven at night, you might be sawing at one. In the winter, it's probably, say, October, late September. It'll probably be sawed the following day. It's just cooler temperatures. Mm -hmm. 
And I, I'm not I'm not suggesting that we don't allow this. I'm just suggesting that uh, both the village and the trustees are gonna are gonna probably hear about that if you guys need to use those extra hours. And it just seems like it would be in all of our best interest to make sure that we have let the community know, especially the folks on 35, that we might be changing this ordinance during this next year. Um, for the, for the board information, our current ordinance for quiet hours is Monday through Friday, 9 p.m. to 7 a.m. So we already, yeah. the week, already have those hours covered. So basically, you're probably discussing just that second point that Barry brought up. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and if you want to limit this to just the, the concrete cutting that he's requesting, that's fine. You can just put that in motion. And as the chief said, it looks like the ordinance already covers through 9 p.m. I, I would add that we can notify the village, you know, probably three to five days ahead of time of when we're going to cut. It's not all the time. It's only when we're doing the main line, you know, with the machine that'll happen. So in North Hudson, that's probably three days to four days of machine pour is where we'd be. You got any kind of decibel level you guys have tested before? Um, on the saw, we're running about 98. Okay, so that's just right around the threshold values of uh, hearing protection and uh, you know, but I'm, of course, you guys all have that on there. But that's just for cutting the new stuff, right? Correct. Okay. The, well, I, would add, I would add that the project right now has in there nighttime work just on the north side at Division Street um, where there's nighttime work allowed, and that's to connect the sanitary sewer and uh, water. We shut it down and we connect. Oh, all right. I got you. When you're tying into the stuff going into Hudson? Yep. Okay. Let's go back to that statement about them notifying us three or four days in advance. Would, would we be more proactive in that and just notifying our residents ahead of time on that sixth street, letting them know that this is going to be potentially happening? And then when it comes to that three or four days in advance, you've got a second warning coming at them? Or we oh, would not... I mean, I think it's just a protocol we could put, not a protocol, but a practice we could probably actually do. I mean, just in the sense is that we're, we're making them aware of. I mean, they're already, as we know, an inconvenience was happening right now in front of their house. But uh, anything like uh, throughout the evening at 1, 2 o'clock in the morning and having us all through that point of, you know, certainly could let them know more than once this is coming up. To possibly, Brian, avoid uh, having another meeting that would be an open session like that. Just have them come and express because um, that's kind of the direction I'm going. What's the duration of cutting, Barry? Like how long oh. will it take you when you start? We So if we start pouring at seven um, in the morning, we would start sawing um, on a temperature where we go in the night. We'd start sawing around three or four. And we would saw probably till two in the morning, two thirty, three at the latest. Okay, I looked up decibel levels, and at a hundred, they're suggesting you get out of that decibel level in fifteen minutes. Yeah. But I, I th and we've got uh, comments getting popped up that you know from our participants here. Let's see if I can find that again. <laughs> well. I know from, from, from my past experience, the decibel level drops farther away from the are from the source. It's going to be loud. There's no question about that. But uh, I'm just a little, you know, I mean, is it crucial that uh, that you, I mean, that you could not wait and cut in the morning if you were poured the night before? Um, if the temperatures are hot, yeah, it is, because it'll cause that concrete to uh, crack. And Kevin can, Oyam can, you know, comment on that when it's, you know, you're got 90 degree days or 80 degree days, cutting that concrete is, you know, huge to make sure that crack cracks over the doll bar baskets. Okay. Uh, what, kind of, 
Um, what kind of delays would you expect? Or I get, I understand that you're guessing that if we don't allow this to, like, would this make the project go a week longer, a day longer, or anything like that? Um, it's it's hard to say because it's based on temperature of when we pour and when we can saw. So if you're on, if we're pouring and it's warm out, we could wait, you know, a week until it cools off to saw, you know, at optimal times, or we'd have to pour, you know, early in the morning and not have a full pour, which doesn't give you a smooth road. We're trying to uh, pour all the segment at once, which is 1500 feet roughly. So just to clarify, Barry, so you're looking for like a three to four day period here to actually pour out everything within the whole village limits? Yes, there's only two and a half segments. Segment four, five, and half of three are in the village of North Hudson, which are, I believe, which is north of the bridge. Yep. Each segment is going to have roughly one day of mainline pouring. And in and I'm just adding, you know, that's three days. And I'm just adding a fourth day in case there's a partial segment. It's not a huge, you know, request. It's not weekly. We're talking, you know, right now we started segment four. Um, sometime probably late June would be the first one where we'd be. If it's late June, be, be, the first time you'd be cutting would be late June. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Well then guys, we have enough time to put it on the next agenda for the public to know. Well, I'm right going there. back to the com communication again. I mean, depending on what we do, you're saying don't vote on this, but postpone this to the next Meeting, Brian, you're saying, or what? Or I have, so you have more people come to the meeting and discuss it? Yeah, I'm, I'm requesting that, yeah, because it, obviously we're not in as big a hurry as at least we thought earlier. If it, they're not going to cut till the end of June, we can have this on our June agenda and so, tell the public. So then if the public uh, has an uproar, we're going to stop the project? Right, exactly. I'm not saying we stop the project, but to not, you, to me, I don't want someone coming up to me and saying, why didn't you guys have, hold a public meeting on this and at least give us a chance to talk. And I'm really thinking about the people on 35. I, I don't know that I'll hear it from where I'm at in the village, but the people right there are going to hear it. Well, you'll hear it every place in the village. I, I've been around enough <laughs> of these things, you know I mean? And again, it's three or four days total part time, right? Yes. So it's not like it's going to be continuous for weeks and months on end. And, and you don't pour, you, are you going to pour each, all, every section back to back? I mean, three days in a row, four days in a row? No. No, no. that's what I, that's kind of what I thought. So it'll be a section and then you'll, you do, you know, do the changeover and then there'll be another section. So it could be, one day pour and then nothing for another month. Yeah. Correct. Okay. We're building two sections at a time. So we're building one in Hudson and one in North Hudson. So they could be, you know, closer together, but North Hudson would only experience one, you know, at a time. Um, right. Yeah. So my question was the same as Stan's when you said three to four days of cutting, that means three to day, four days total. I believe you just said that. And it sounds like then we're going to have two or is it three cutting sessions in North Hudson? And then my next question is how many, how much notice ahead of the actual day of cutting will we have to tell people to get their earplugs out or whatever? <laughs> All right. So um, there are, th there's basically two and a half segments. So best case scenario is three nights and it all depends on temperatures, whether it's nights or days and how light we go. You know, there are times we could be done at 10, 11 o'clock. It all depends on temperatures and when we can start sawing. Um, the hotter it is, the better it is. It's that in between cool is where you, you gotta wait till the concrete is at that optimal, you know, hardness to get on it to saw. Mm -hmm. There'll be more sawing than that, but all the rest of the sawing would be during the day based on the pores. Um, the notice I said three to five days, I know three to five days ahead of time because I'll start trimming and setting line where I can notify the village, you know, that here's our day of pour, you know, our window of, 
you know, one, either a Friday or a Monday, we're going to pour. And it's based on how fast it gets ready and what the weather does rain. So that's why I say the three to five days, you know, we would be able to give that very comfortably to the village. Okay, great. And then also, if I'm hearing correctly, if we would choose not to approve this, we won't get as good a quality job because it's essential that it is cut at the appropriate temperature in order to have the highest quality road. Um, so we really don't have a choice, correct? No, I'm not going to say that. You, <laughs> you'll get the quality. It's just a matter of when we pour. We might not pour if we oh, can't okay. at night, but you're still going to get the same high, the quality product that in the city limits or village limits in North Hudson. It's just a matter of when we pour. Is what and then doing. it could be in each instance up to a week delay in the job if we chose not to cut in unusual hours. If Did it's I also possible. hear that? It's, it's possible. It okay. could be a day. It, there, there's other conditions that could happen, but you know, I'm trying to make this the most optimal uh, right. time to call and get the project done as fast as we can. Right. Because if we have to do it again next year or winter comes early, that's a big problem also. I, it, I it's a huge problem. And basically segment five, the farthest north one, is the last segment we do. That one should not be a problem because I've, I'm figuring I'm pouring that one in September to October to late, early November, depending on how we do our schedule. So mm -hmm. that really shouldn't be a problem because we cut that in the morning unless we had a warm fall. Isn't there something reasonable about how late this could go, though? I just heard two in the morning. That seems to me not acceptable. Crickets. Well, when, uh, Chief, Chief, when do we normally shut down bands playing at night? Midnight. It's midnight. I mean, we bring that in front of the board, though, and have that approved. <clears throat> right. To answer your question, when it comes to the businesses, typically it's 10 p.m. Um, yeah. Pepperfest typically goes in a little bit later for their event. But uh, again, that's a a music type event where this I, it's, I would consider it to be a little different. Okay. So what what we're saying is potentially it's four times that this could run late in the, over the course of the entire summer, the entire project. Correct. There's running late though, past, past 9 p.m. And then there's running until two in the morning. It seems like there's gotta be something in between there that would be more reasonable. Well, I would, I would think that they're, they're the very, and, and they would be looking at the forecast to, Try to, to I, I'm pretty sure they don't want to be up cutting at that time of the day either, I would guess. It all depends on, you know, like with everything in this project is going to be weather dependent. If we get a, a wet spring, this could throw all, you know, I mean, our, our wetter spring and wetter summer, this could really prolong everything there. So, I mean, uh, I, I myself am, uh, I'm okay with the, the option, the chance that it might be, you know, three, four days that, uh, yeah, we're going to get some phone calls and, uh, you know, it's, uh, but it's, uh, I mean, this project's been going on for a long time and it's, it, there's going to be inconveniences. There has been with everything so far, as far as mailboxes, uh, garbage hauling. Uh, so I'm just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm okay with the ordinance change or the, the, uh, exception if it, you know, but I mean, I want everybody to, you know, be heard and, and uh, then we, you know, because we have a vote to say okay, the you know the exception, or we have a vote down. So, uh, Barry, if we move this to next month, would that affect you at all, or would you be okay with that? I actually would be okay with that. Is it early in the month again? Yes, first, yeah, yeah. first Tuesday. Yeah, I would be okay with that. I mean, I, 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 I've been in a lot of big projects, urban projects, you know, with businesses. Um, I did Belknap two years ago uh, with all the businesses in that. Um, the first thing is it's an inconvenience for the businesses, it's an inconvenience for the residents. Um, but I'm bound by the contract that I signed with the state of Wisconsin, and that's all I can follow. Um, and we're doing our best. Um, the mailboxes, there was nothing in the thing about the mailboxes. Um, Tony, project manager, has built some mailboxes to go 
you know, in segments to help with the mail carriers that are out there. Um, just so you know, the noise level on the paver is about the same when it goes through and paves. Um, the excavators, you know, they're a little less because they're newer and they're, they're a little more quieter. Um, you're going to see inconvenience with water shutdowns on this project where people are going to, you know, go door to door and say, tomorrow we're going to hook up your new water and you'll be without water for an hour or two. You know, they're, they're all inconveniences of the project, but the end result is what we're looking at is what you're going to get in return, you know, when this is done. But to answer your question, I'm fine with postponing it to have more comment on, you know, what people... I don't, not so much comments, so, but more what people can expect and why it's being done, I think is the more important thing on doing that. Yeah. A little better understanding, you know, because right. when you say, Hey, we're going to be cut until two in the morning. Well, how many days, you know, I mean, a lot of that, I mean, yeah, that's a, I know we get complaints every year that the music goes too long and too loud at Pepper Festival. From <laughs> in those, those, well, I mean, they're right. There's people that live right there and, yep. you know, but, uh, no, I, if, if we can postpone it for a month, I would be good with that. And, uh, you know, and uh, I think uh, it'll give us a chance to explain better to the, you know, to the people around there that, hey, you know, and this is worst case scenario, I believe it's to that time of the morning. If they can, if the weather cooperates, you can cut it, you know, you can be cutting and, and doing it earlier in the day. Correct. This will also give the community more questions just in case we're not thinking of everything. So I, I like the idea of postponing it because it's not going to affect anything. And it gives the, the village of North Hudson also a little bit more time to know what's coming. Is there any way to set a, a lesser parameter than two in the morning, like midnight? How does that affect the project if it's, if it's not so open-ended? Because um, I can't answer that. It's based on the concrete, how fast it's curing. It could be less if it's curing slowly and the optimum time to saw it starts at nine o'clock at night, you know, I'm going to go later. I, and if I don't saw it, you know, there's a chance of premature cracking, which means the panel gets removed and you don't have that continuous panel. You have a patched road to start brand new because you had a crack. So I can't answer that question of, you know, can we shut it down the sawing at noon? Because once I start, I have to finish. I, I can't just call it a day. I think it sounds like Barry's being very reasonable. He's the expert and thorough. I agree that if we have a month and it doesn't hurt anything, it's in everyone's best interest to inform the residents as much as possible. But obviously we have to go ahead with it. Maybe we could get a bunch of, I'm not even kidding, like foam earplugs and give them out because they might have, <laughs> you know, and telling people these are the parameters. We're doing the best we can. It's going to be a rough summer, but I think you're right. When people feel a part of it, they're much less apt to just complain later. And I've slept in those earplugs over numerous occasions that, you know, different things. And they, they're, they are, you know, I mean, the, the soft plugs are, you don't even hardly know they're there. Yeah. But uh, yeah, if we have to do that, they're there. Those, those things are cheap, but uh, let's, uh, let's see. Did we have them? I mean, we had a motion. We just redraw it or take pause, we table it until next month. Well, we can just table that till next month, right? Yeah, you can just withdraw your motion now and table the item for next okay. month. Okay, I withdraw the motion. No, I'll withdraw my second. Okay. Um, the, one que the one question I have is the, um, right now the project special state seven to seven. Um, in North Hudson, we're allowed to work seven to nine, which is great because that's what we want. That extra two hours when the sun is shining, you know, helps us get more done and more productive. Do you need that to set? Well, we have seven nine already, yeah. So you don't need it to set it at all right now. So yeah, you're good, Barry. Yep. Yep. I appreciate it. And in the meantime, we can work on, you know, being a little more specific with the motion to limit it just to the cutting and so right. it's not just a general override of all the hours. Nope. And, I, and I hope we can get some kind of communication together that at least we could hand out to the folks on 35. Yeah. Close to the project. So if somebody that lives on 35, that would be greatly appreciated, Mr. Pike. 
The lack of you communication have, has been very really astounding. Wait, wait. Barry, do you have any kind of document or anything explaining this kind of work that you've handed out before? I'm um, not really, but I can bring. Uh, I can send uh, um, the village, you know, a uh, policy on why we cut and you know what the benefits are and you know, versus wet sawing versus dry sawing, which we're doing early entry sawing and what the benefits, I can forward that on to you, Melissa, tonight. That's good. Yep. And Great. it'll show, just, it'll document studies that are done in Iowa and Texas of why it's done better this way. So um, we did the Knapp Hill last year, um, or last two years, we were the concrete supplier on the Knapp Hill on I-94. And there's days we saw, started sawing at three in the morning or three in the afternoon. We didn't get done till six in the morning. But that's sawing a lot bigger length. You know, that's 4,000 feet of 26 foot wide with two saws. And this is a residential area where people are living within feet. And I, and I understand that. And that's why we're coming to you right away and talking about this, um, of what we've got and what we typically do. So. Appreciate it. Um, is there any other concerns from the village? I mean, we're more than welcome to attend your meetings, virtual Zoom every month to answer questions on the construction project to keep you informed of where we're at and what we're doing. Ooh, I like it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it makes the project go better if you have, you know, you can ask what's going on and what's happening. You know, it'd either be myself or Tony. Uh, what do a couple of the people that live on 6th Street kind of by Mickelson do with UPS? Do they walk it to their house or are they, I guess that would be one of the questions I have. Okay. Um, to answer, and some of these questions might be, you know, I'm alluding the question, but I'm not. Uh, when we bid the project, some of this stuff was not in the project, you know, documentations of how things are handled. So, you know, we're not contractually, you know, in the point to do extra stuff or to, you know, make arrangements. The arrangements that I understand were the DOT had stated when this was asked was that they can come down the side streets, park and walk the package. The sidewalk that's in these segments will be one side of the road will be kept North Hudson you, on the North end. You don't have sidewalk going continuous, but in the South end, I believe you do have sidewalk. Is that correct? Yeah, um, from yes. Summer we're going to do one the bridge. Yep, we're going to do one side or the other at a time. So there'll always be one side pedestrian access coming down the street. Um, the sidewalk, as you know, right now is being left in place. Um, where it will be tore up is when we start doing the laterals. And our intent is to come in there, fix the sidewalk, pour the curb before we even pave with the machine so that we have new sidewalk and new curb and gutter already in place to do that. Uh, to answer your question, um, we have put it back to the carriers, UPS, FedEx, um, through the DOT has done it, saying it's under construction. You know, this is the, what avenues are left you know, to deliver your packages. Um, they can put them in the mailbox if they will fit. Otherwise, they'd have to walk to the door. And then are you letting know, uh, are you letting the people know where they're moving their mailbox to? I couldn't see that on the DOT page. Um, Tony, you're on. Um, I believe he has sent a letter and we'll notify him. Tony? Yes, I, I walked a couple of weeks back, knocked on every door that was between Mickelson and Monroe. Um, obviously, I caught who was home. Um I haven't had any issues directly yet. Most people are were aware they're actually very pleasant of, of you know what we're doing and, and accommodating. Um, I'm sure that I'll be hearing about it in the next couple of days from either the post office or the the, the landowners. Um, but yeah, at this point, the mailboxes are up, and I keep telling people if, if you do have any issues or if there's if something we can do, you gotta let me know. Can you uh, state your like email address for us real quick so I could. Uh put this link there so they could send you if they have any questions. Certainly. Um, he, Melissa, Tony? you have it, don't you? I, Sorry? yes. Melissa, do you have, to, you have our emails, don't you? Um, I just have that one contact list. You, you're the one that had emailed me earlier, right? Yes. Tony, you did? On the website. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Whatever was on that contact list and if it's on the website. 
Um, I know it's on the website. I was just hoping to make it as easy as possible for the people that do have the questions. Well, it's Tony, T-O-N-Y, at ChippewaConcrete.net. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any further discussion? And it's the table. Do we have to vote on tabling? We can just say it's tabled till next month, Paul? No. Okay. Thank so you guys we'll, very much. We will thank you, yeah, Tony and Barry. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure you'll be hearing from uh, folks. I mean, they know where your trailer is now, so you can't hide. You know, that's the <laughs> that's the best person to talk to. Is that the trailer? <laughs> right. Uh, he is the DOT representative for the project, so he basically uh, is like the coach of the whole project, and everything we do is by contract and everything that's not by contract, he deals with on how it's going to be handled. Example, post office, uh, garbage, um, mail, you know, we work through him on all these issues of what works and what doesn't. So that sounds if great. The, if you want us on the meetings you know, going forward, just make sure we get an attachment saying, here's the meeting and please attend. And we can answer questions to let people know what's going on. Uh, Barry, I would suggest getting a light. You, your picture is very dark and we can't see you. <laughs> that There's a reason for that. That when I'm walking down the street, you won't know who I am. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that is brilliant. You, you, you're like, I'm not very computer savvy, so you're lucky I even got it open. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was in a full panic earlier. I hit the wrong button and couldn't find myself either. So it was like, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to going back to the hall, but uh, that'll be up for discussion later today. Uh, okay, so I think we're done with these guys for tonight. Yeah, let them get some rest so they can fire up tomorrow. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. You guys, thanks a lot Bye. for being here and, and for thanks, being guys. up front. Yep. Bye. Super. Okay. Let's see. That's the noise ordinance. Uh, uh, let's see. Melissa, is we, do we have uh, elders here for the Project Highway 35 financing? Yes, Brian Riley. Is Hi, Brian. On. Okay, this this is uh, item uh, six is the financing of the Highway 35 project with, from Ehlers. Uh, and uh, obviously we need uh, to do financing and it says possible approval. So uh, we need a motion. I don't, I don't know if there's anything to approve today or not. Yeah, Ryan, I don't see a motion on there. No. Okay. Yeah, I just I wasn't sure, so that's why. I, yeah, I just saw approval, so I assume I assume that there was that. You know, right. like I know I shouldn't assume stuff. Okay, <laughs> so uh, uh, you're up, uh, Brian. Good evening. Can everybody hear me? Okay. We can. Sure. Again. All right. I see nodding heads. Thank you. Uh, just as a matter of, of introduction, um, you know, I see maybe a few names I recognize since um, we've been in front of the board. You know, Ellers as a firm has a, a good amount of history working uh, with the village at, in the capacity as a financial advisor, uh, really dating back to, I wanna say about 2004. Um, you've clearly you know, had some, some success working directly uh, with say local banks in terms of uh, some project financing, equipment financing, et cetera. Uh, there are occasions where things get a little more complex and, and you have to look at the totality of options available to you. Uh, Ellers as a firm is uh, what we would call independent advisors. That is uh, fundamentally, we're not a bank. We don't buy bonds. Uh, we just give advice. So uh, we're always on your side of the table. And so in that capacity as your advisor, we also uh, have a fiduciary responsibility to you. So we must put your interests above our own. Uh, so as was discussed, there is no formal action needed this evening, but in, in talking with Melissa and getting some updates from Kevin, so like there's some definition around um, what, your, uh, what your portion uh, of the project is going to entail. So we'll walk you through that, but it's probably useful for us just to kind of see where you sit presently in terms of your current debt profile. And um, I think you'll see what I mean by that here in a moment. Then we'll talk a little bit about, um, you know, the current project and, and what that might look like and what your financing options are. Uh, and as we move along, you know, I, I don't necessarily need anybody to kind of wait till the end 
to ask questions. So if you want to interject or otherwise get a clarification or ask a question, uh, please just speak up and I'll pause and we'll address them as they come. Uh, that can be a little difficult through a, a Zoom meeting, uh, but I think uh, we can all handle that. It usually works pretty well. So I'm going to... Uh, Tim and Stan, you guys aren't muted. I'm going to attempt to share my screen and uh, walk you through just a very brief presentation. Um, I, I'm happy to just talk, but I think the numbers kind of crystallize a mental image on a, on a few things. Uh, let's see, maybe you're at the wrong screen. Let's try that one more time. Can everybody see the presentation? We can, Brian. Yep. Yes. Actually, now that I'm looking at it here. I think you accidentally muted yeah. yourself, Brian. I am making all the Zoom mistakes. <laughs> I'm, I'm usually 100%. I do these all the time. So um, thanks for bearing with me. And hopefully we all get a little chuckle out of it periodically. So um, in any event, um, we should be good here on this one. That we lost your screen sharing. Yeah, one. It's coming back oh, up. There. Okay. All right. So you should see discussion topics at the top, uh, with the bulleted list, uh, and we talked through a few of these. So um, you know, I, I also want to just make you aware. You know, rates are very low, and I don't think that's a surprise to anybody. You have existing debt, and we have kind of briefly looked at it for refinancing purposes. So I'll touch on that at the end um, as well, as well as what I would argue is a kind of a preliminary finance plan that we can come back at another time to refine that and, and potentially get some authorizations in place. So. Um, what we're looking at is the use of a general obligation debt to finance these projects. You have a number of tools available to you in this regard, but this is really the most flexible one and is suitable for this particular type of financing, even though it is largely uh, utility oriented. Uh, you do have five issues outstanding, dating the oldest dating back to 2012 with the final payment this year. Um, and then you got a series of, of issues over a handful of years, all with 10 year uh, final payment structures, uh, largely their level payments, um, and then maybe uh, about a half payment in some of the final years based upon the dating schemes. Uh, your use of geo debt is limited by law. And so we have to look at those metrics. You're in great shape, but just so you're aware, when you issue general obligation debt, that's a very strong pledge to the holder of that. that you're, you're basically telling them, uh, we pledge to you our full faith and credit, so any available source of funds to make the debt payment, as well as pledging uh, in, in a revocable and unlimited tax levy. So whenever the board adopt, adopted the resolutions that, that awarded those particular debt issues that we just talked about, you told the holder of that debt that all future boards are bound to that tax levy, and none of them can arbitrarily repeal it. Uh, so again, that's a very, very strong pledge and therefore the state limits your ability to issue that form of debt since you're encumbering the tax base. The metric under law is 5% of your total equalized value. That's your statutory borrowing capacity. Uh, your most recent equalized value is just under 500 million. That puts you at 24 and a half million of available borrowing capacity. Uh, certainly you're nowhere near that. You actually have less than a million outstanding presently. Um, and we look all the way through to the end of the year because you have set your levy, you've adopted your budget, all the fundamentally be there. Uh, so that leaves you with uh, almost 24 million in available borrowing capacity. Uh, just like this project, you've issued geo debt for a number of different purposes. And in the case of utilities, you're using utility revenues to essentially abate that required loan that we just talked about. So every year you show transfers coming in from the utility funds, in this case, water and sewer, 
And that's coming into the, the general fund slash debt service fund for those individual issues. And then the net amount is what you're levying taxes for. All right. And that's typically going to be pieces of equipment, streets, buildings, things of that nature. Um, and, and so your, your levy for debt service for fiscal 2021 uh, was about $197,000. So out of your entire tax levy, that is the dollar amount that is attributable only to debt service from the general fund. The water utility picked up uh, about $63,000 in general obligation debt service and the sewer utility about $40,000. Uh, your debt profile is, is got pretty ramid, I'm sorry, rapid uh, amortizations. So your debt's paid off rather fast, which is good because you incur less interest because of that. And so you have these step downs that are occurring as debt is retired. And what I mean by that is your levy for debt service is going to decline next year to $112,000 and it will be fully extinguished without any new debt in 2027. Um, so, you know, you have to tell me what the likelihood is of, of issuing additional debt away from these projects. But right now your levy for debt service is declining until it reaches zero essentially in 27. Um, and there are some more dramatic declines as you go forward in time and some of those older issues are paid in full. Uh, similar scenario with the water utility and sewer utilities. Um, the water utility, its debt service will decline from the roughly 63,000 above down to 32,000. So cut up, cut in half roughly in 2022. And then it is fully extinguished by 2024. Uh, so pretty rapid decline there towards zero. And then the sewer utility uh, is in a similar situation in that it drops from about 40,000 to 8,600 for 2022 and then stays about at that level until paid in full in 24. Uh, so I'll pause to see if there are any questions uh, by anyone here rather than have see if you raise your hand. And I can't see everybody, so please just speak up. Will we be able to get a copy of the PowerPoint? Yes, Melissa, ha Melissa um, does have that. And, and it's, can it's, on, it's on the website. Oh, I missed it. Thank you. All right. So, and let's get uh, dialed in then to um, this specific set of projects. And so uh, Cedar and Kevin at Cedar was kind enough to break these down by purpose. That's for a number of reasons. If you intended to issue general obligation bonds, those are authorized by the purpose or the underlying purposes of the projects. And uh, also we wanna look to the utilities to pick up their allocable share of the debt service. So that's why we've set them out on their own. So in this case, uh, sanitary sewers, about a half a million, water, 737,000, and then collectively between stormwater oversizing and some of the associated landscaping uh, along the project route, that's going to be somewhere around $137,000 total allocable to the general fund. So the vast majority of this is utility oriented uh, with the bulk being water. And so, as I said, as we move forward, then we're going to want to allocate a repayment to the utilities and see how that's going to impact those funds. Um, but then also allow you to track things over time. So you can identify how much in principle has been paid down by fund Right? So the general fund will have so much in principle and it will get retired over time. Same with water, same with sewer. You know, your auditors will appreciate that when they assist in kind of putting the financial statements together uh, at the end of the year. It will also allow you to identify points in time if you, uh, if you uh, build cash where you can pay off certain portions uh, when you have that um, ability. So what would the impact be with respect to borrowing capacity? Uh, I think you could infer based on the prior slide that you're still gonna be in great shape, even if you take on 100% uh, debt financing uh, for these projects. So we built an issue, included all associated costs of issuance, and you know, we always try to be conservative in, in terms of building the budget for that. Uh, we'll look at the next page here in a moment that'll depict that a little more clearly. And you arrive at an issue size of a million four forty on an estimated basis. So that would leave you with just under twenty two and a half million dollars remaining, or over ninety percent real full capacity. So obviously, no concerns there. You're in fine condition to take on any other financing that you might need for the foreseeable future. Uh, importantly, levy impact. I think as you look at that prior, uh, those prior dollar amounts attributable to the general fund, they're rather nominal. 
Um, so it's not going to be a very large tax impact. And we can do some structuring with the debt with both of the levy portion and the utilities to take into consideration what the existing debt service is. So we're not just stacking. We can, we can kind of feather it in, uh, so to speak. Um, and I think that our next discussion would bring that forward in more explicit detail so you can see the underlying uh, analysis that we typically do there. Uh, utility impacts, then, and again, we're looking at uh, the most recent set of audited financials being 2019. Uh, and based upon the uh, revenue expense profile, what cash flow is available, both utilities appear to be able to fully service the new debt. Water will be a little tighter, uh, I suspect. Um, and it's probably not that far off from having at least draft numbers for the water utility given um, PSC reporting requirements potentially. So uh, we can firm some of those up, but sewer would be about 32,000 a year. Water would be about 47,000 a year given this larger project allocation cost. So here is the uh, preliminary debt sizing. Uh, I'm sorry, was there, was there a question? All right, I'll continue. Uh, preliminary debt sizing, and we also have some estimated rates based on current market conditions. So here's the breakdown by purpose. So we've got uh, the sewer, the water, and then our two uh, essentially general fund components comprising the underlying detail related to the million 440. As you continue down, the use of funds is basically you're borrowing X, and then where is that money going? And it's doing a number of things. First and foremost, it's paying for projects. That's the deposit to the construction fund at a million three seventy four, which matches our prior number. And then there are fees and expenses. Uh, contemplates that uh, the village undertake a securities offering. Uh, the last time you did that was 2012. Prior to that was 2004. I believe the 2012 issue would actually be financed. Uh, the 2004 issue, uh, you do carry an A1 rating uh, from Moody's, and we have basically reestablished that at those junctures in the past. So what that means is that the way you access capital is to go to a bond dealer, uh, often termed an underwriter. Uh, that, that institution is the initial purchaser of your bonds, and they don't buy them to own them to earn interest. Uh, they're like a car dealer. They're not going to, you know, the car dealer doesn't have all the cars on the lots to go drive them around. They're in the business of selling and buying cars. Same thing with the bond dealer. They're going to underwrite the new issue, and then they're going to make that available to their investor customers in pieces. But you get the benefit of finding just one buyer. They underwrite the risk of distribution of the bonds. And as such, again, not interested in interest income, they are essentially going to work for a fee. And we have that estimated or budgeted at one and a half percent and typically will allow for them to improve that through more of a competitive style um, procurement, much like you do for construction projects where the bonds go out to bid once they're sized and structured. Then it's the lowest interest cost, lowest fee proposal is the owner of the bonds. Cost of issuance, that's not just us. We are one of uh, the line items that underlie that 43500 uh, you would typically engage a, uh, a specialized legal counsel called a bond attorney in this instance that that's all they do is work in the area of municipal finance, as well as tax law. Uh, you get the benefit of your debt being exempt from federal income taxation. That is, whoever owns your debt does not pay federal income tax on the interest income that you pay to them. And that attorney is going to provide an opinion that you comply with all the uh, regulations and requirements associated with tax exempt debt. So based on what we put together in current market rates uh, and at your A1 rating, we're estimating, you know, somewhere approaching 2% on a 20 year basis. Uh, and we do have a little fudge factor in there. I think as was mentioned before, you're not taking any action tonight uh, to make things final. You would move forward in time and as such, none of us have control over interest rates and we generally try to be conservative both in estimating cost of issuance as well as interest rates. Um, and so we've got about 0.2% over current market. And, and those are not anomalies. That is where we are at in the tax exempt market. So very, very low bond pricing right now. Uh, certainly from our perspective, we're agnostic as far as the source of capital. It, it could be a local bank, it could be the capital markets through what I just described. Our obligation to you is to help you evaluate on an all-in basis, 
what, what is suitable for you and recommend and what would our recommend recommendation be in that regard. So um, certainly the capital markets provide right now the lowest cost of capital and the ability to fix your rates out to 20 years in term, which is the longest term possible for general obligation debt from the date of issue. I'll pause there and see if there are any questions before we uh, move on. All right, uh, so you do have some debt outstanding. It's rather short and as such, even though the rates are, are higher than what we can achieve um, with the new money, it's highly unlikely we're gonna generate any meaningful savings. So can we bring the rate down? We could. Once you tag on some costs and then those costs are amortized over a very short period of time, it'll likely make some of these refinancings inefficient. Um, I do wanna have them run in a little more depth here. The ones that are at 275 to two and seven eighths might provide some marginal benefit. Um, and then I can show you what that looks like. The last thing we would do is ask you to refinance debt, which ends up costing you more money or is essentially a break, uh, maybe even a break even scenario. There are some, there's some nuance to this in that even if you have a break even situation, um, there are qualitative factors such as sometimes it's just easier to have one less debt issue to administer, right? It's one less thing to deal with from a staff perspective. You have a lot of efficiencies when things are consolidated. So those sorts of things are important. Uh, we'd like to save money if we can, but we can kind of walk through that um, when we get more in depth with debt structure at a high level, uh, as well as the potential to refinance any issues. But um, the initial review is that there's not tremendous amount of savings to be garnered. Uh, one other aspect that we like to delve into, um, just given that you're embarking on a, a larger uh, debt issue for financing purposes is uh, really multifaceted and any other projects that are out there that should be considered for financing we could make the argument that you'd likely be better to include them in this sort of debt issue from an efficiency and, and how the impact is managed. It becomes far easier from your perspective to manage the impact of new debt service when it's all taken holistically rather than from year to year. Because then you just start stacking on by and large, we can do some certain things with the structure to mitigate the upfront impact. You don't have to add anything if you don't want to, but if you had some other financing that was gonna be needed this year, this is a good time to discuss it in the context of taking on financing for State Highway 35. And then further, if there's anything in the next few years, the argument is not to add it to this and, and borrow for things that you're not sure of, but if you do have things that are hanging out there that we need to be considering from a debt structure perspective to allow you the ability to absorb them later, it's better for us to know now and to take that into consideration and show you what some options might look like from a planning perspective. That doesn't cost you anything. Um, you know, on our end, we would much prefer to have that information and try to incorporate it into our broader finance plan that we would present to you for consideration uh, than to really just kind of move forward, not know about it, and then you have to think about it later. It becomes far more difficult at that point. Uh, Brian? Yes. This is Stan. Uh, now, so we've got a uh, Wisconsin Street project coming up, like, uh, I think next year. So this is something that we should be talking about with you guys now to make you aware of that. Is that what you're trying to say? Potentially. Uh, what dollar, give a, just a rough dollar amount on that? Melissa? Um, or Kevin? Kevin, Kevin might be able to answer that. Yeah, I did look at the last estimated cost of that project, the updated one, and it looks like it's around 350000 would be what the village's share is, around that dollar figure. When you say share, Kevin, uh, what's the kind of the, the nuance around that particular project that we might need to be familiar with? So basically, sewer and water, that's 100% locally funded again. It's another DOT project per okay. se. And that one has its STP program. So there are some cost sharing items with like sidewalks and curbs and pavement. And that's at a 20%. Okay. Sure. Um, you know, a few things jump out at me there in this context would be number one, um, I think Kevin can also speak to the fact that those DOT projects are really um, 
what's the word I'm looking for? You know, the, the timing is one thing, but when they actually bill you for costs, I've always heard it can be very, uh, uh, it can be very significantly from one community to another. And in fact, linger for months, if not over a year. Um, and, and that can present some issues with tax exempt debt. The other thing too is um, I hate to under borrow for something like that too, given where costs are going. Then the last piece of that is you will be getting uh, an allocation of funds on the most recent federal legislation, which can be used for utility projects. So I'm not arguing that's what you use the money for, but uh, I appreciate at least knowing about it because then we can have this discussion, but that may be where you want to spend some of those dollars versus borrow for them. Maybe not. You should do some prioritization and understand that perhaps it is then premature to somehow tie that into uh, a financing this year. No, that was just a question. I mean, I'm yeah. good with the, the way everything is going. I but thank you for that answer. No, that's exactly what we're looking for is to have a dialogue uh, about it, and and just knowing is is helpful. So, um, from a from a timing perspective, uh, a number of things would need to fall into place, and certainly I'm interested in thoughts and opinions on how you might want to finance this. Again, uh, we started in a position that. The, the capital markets where you would issue bonds as securities provides the lowest cost. It's not the only consideration. You could do bank financing. Uh, you will not get a fixed rate for a 20 year term. Uh, pretty much the longest any bank is gonna be willing to fix you a rate will be 10 years and it'll be subject to reset. Uh, you can have a, a longer amortization of course, but you'll have essentially a balloon structure with a reset um, and essentially you'll, you'll recast the deck chair, so to speak, with a refinancing transaction that will reestablish the rate uh, in the future. Uh, could be higher, could be lower. Probability would be that it'd be higher based upon the current environment. Um, there are places in the world where rates have gone below zero. Uh, the United States is not one of them, but uh, we can, we can uh, keep our eye on that. Uh, so just kind of a standard protocol and calendar for a, a traditional bond sale uh, we're obviously having our discussions today and we can come away with this with a sense of how to potentially refine and dial in um, what the solution is. And uh, assuming you're meeting once a month and that's the, ca the cadence within which you want to make decisions, uh, June, there be some required actions of the board. Anytime you issue general obligation bonds, the, uh, the village is required to adopt what are called initial or authorizing resolutions. Those resolutions state your intent to the public to issue bonds for what are enumerated purposes under law. There is literally a laundry list for which you can issue bonds without uh, elector approval. Um, you meet all those requirements with the projects that you have in front of you. You do not need elector approval, but you do need to adopt authorizing resolutions uh, those will also establish not to exceed amounts. And while they don't dictate the structure of the debt, that's also the point in time where we would come before you and say, this is what we've initially established for what the debt is going to look like on a repayment basis. And you say, Brian, I like that. Let's run with that. Or, hey, can we revise that for whatever reason? We go through another iteration. Um, or you say, as long as you do that and, and we're walking away, then we're good to proceed. Uh, so essentially that gives us direction as well because we're going to use that information to prepare a lot of documents along with the bond attorney. So um, walking away from that, we get the authorization. We have an initial sense of the debt structure, what things are going to look like and how that calendar will unfold. The bond sale itself would typically then occur a month later. So July, uh, and, you, and as I said before, you could move faster, um, certainly, but you know, typically the next month we'd have the actual bond sale. And so from our perspective, again, we're here to stand side by side with you and you've had some success in the past, and especially with your A1 rating, selling bonds was called competitively. So essentially we work together to put the whole thing together. We'll prepare some documents on your behalf in conjunction with the bond attorney and we put together what is essentially a securities offering document, a lot like a prospectus that many of us would know in our kind of personal financial lives. Uh, and that goes out to the, the, the investment community. So investors can see it, the underwriters who are going to potentially purchase those bonds, see it. And then on the day of your meeting, proposals for purchase of the bonds come into our office, they're tabulated. Uh, lowest interest cost is generally going to be the verbal award. A bunch of documents get finalized during the day and a resolution comes before the board that will essentially 
fix the rates and terms. And so essentially we have executed the transaction at that point contractually. And that just sets us up then for closing that would occur roughly three weeks later. So you'd have money in hand in August. As I mentioned just earlier, you could advance this calendar a little bit, but there is certainly a decent amount of work to be done. Uh, that's usually behind the scenes that, that you're not um, rolling your sleeves up to accomplish, but some, th some things do need to be done that just take a certain amount of time. Um, so maybe you could shave uh, two weeks, shaving a whole month would probably be aggressive um, and perhaps not warranted. So we can shift some things around, but you, know, you could sell in June and close in July but that would probably be like later in June, you could sell, um, you know, versus early June, just because we need some authorizations to unfold. We need certain things to happen. So uh, that, that is what I have from, for prepared content. And certainly interested in comments, happy to answer questions. Uh, we've got the benefit, obviously, of Kevin being uh, on the call here too, to supplement anything that I'm not able to answer. So I'll, I'll open it up to all of you. I'll stop screen sharing as well. Thank you, Brian. This is a good presentation. So I, my, my, my only question is on the ter term, term, the length, 20 years. Is that standard? I know it increases the annual payments if we were to go shorter, of course, but uh, yes. is 20 years based just basic off looking at our finances and how we could handle that? Or maybe Melissa could hand answer that also. But. There's, there's no hard and fast rule. What I would typically look to is what's the useful life of the assets you're financing? You know, you wouldn't want to finance a squad car over 15 years. Right. Um, but sewer water, the useful life of those assets is going to be longer than the debt. So there is nothing inherently wrong with financing fixed assets like infrastructure over a 20 and sometimes even longer term. I'm not recommending you go longer than 20. In fact, geo debt has to be fully retired within 20 years from its date of issue, no matter how many times you refinance it. So that it really is the max term for this type of debt. And then I start to look at from a payment perspective, you know, where's the money coming from? And what's the impact to that fund? On the tax levy side, you can levy an unlimited amount. Uh, practically speaking, are you gonna do that? No, of course not. So then we wanna kind of map to, you know, what, what looks good from your end, from what can you absorb? In the case of the um, portion attributable to the general fund, I would argue you don't need to go 20 years with the stormwater oversizing and the, um, the landscaping. I can show you what it looks like 20 years. I can also show you what it looks like to go shorter. So you're not incurring as much interest. The sewer and water utilities probably need something approximating the 20 year term so that they do have a reduced payment to not stress the cash flow of the utilities. You want to generate excess cash flow net of your debt service payments so that you're not constantly borrowing for um, maintenance improvements, et cetera. You wanna generate some free cash flow from those utilities, even if it is a small amount, so that you're building cash balances or you're taking care of those unforeseen things that are just kind of the quick fixes and that are not long lived improvements. So I hope that answers your question. It did, thank you. Anybody else got questions? Uh, uh, one other thing, ahead, Santa, and Melissa, I'm assuming this is going to go through finance first, right, committee, when we, in June, and then we'll bring it, right? Um, yeah, I suppose, yeah, it could go through finance. I mean, is that and, normal practice? And then board. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I, I haven't thought about that yet, but. Okay, thank you. Anything else? What is the date? Well, meeting, Melissa? I'm sorry. Are you are you are you meeting um, just once a month as far as the project goes, which is certainly fine. And then I would just look to. <clears throat> yeah, so it's, it's the first Tuesday of June. So June first. Okay. So uh, just to kind of forecast for you, then you'll see a, a laundry list of agenda items on that one, all of which will be related to those authorizing resolutions that I discussed. So the titles of them would be set forth on your agenda. Melissa will get all of that from the bond attorney. She won't have to worry about drafting documents, agenda language, et cetera. We'll, all that will be taken care of. And then I will bring for you to review the underlying detail. Um, and without going into specifics, um, I will try to paint a, a visual image, but 
we'll have what's called our pre-sale report and then they'll have what is the debt going to look like, annual payment requirements, annual principal amounts, annual interest, what are these impacts, you know, more clearly represented in say in graphical form. Um, and then we can have a quick discussion on is, is this work for you? Is this how you want to see things? Do you want to see any adjustments? And then walking away from that, we'll proceed in the same calendar that I just discussed. That sounds good. Uh, anything else? If not, Brian, thank you. That was very well presented. Very, I thought it was great to, to help uh, everybody. We've got new folks and uh, that haven't had to borrow or see how village borrows money and stuff before. So I thought you did a great job and uh, we're looking very forward to working with you. Thank you for saying that. You've all been very good stewards of uh, this financial situation and will accrue benefits when you're taking on major projects like this. Okay. Well, I hope you have a blessed evening and the rest of your week. So you take care and uh, have a good uh, month. <laughs> okay. You as well. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Now, here we go. Next on the edge item agenda, library board update. I see Tracy is here and Shelly is here and they have a presentation to try to let us know what the uh, they've got going on at the library and uh, to get uh, to see if they can uh, expand some things. Uh, and I'll let, uh, I don't know which one do you want to start? Tracy I'll, just, or I'll kick it off if that's all right. Um, so I'm Tracy Whiteley and I um, am the library trustee representing North Hudson. Um, I did send a, a, a report um, to Melissa and I see it, it is on the website. Um, so I would ask that if you could just review that and let me know if you have any questions. My email address is at the end of the presentation or at the end of the, uh, the report. And um, I'm gonna turn it over to Shelly Tugas, who is our interim co-director at the library. And she does have a presentation. Uh, we had wanted to hold a stakeholder retreat um, in May and um, er actually earlier, and we have kept pushing it back because of the uh, pandemic. So right now our, um, our stakeholder retreat date is pushed out to sometime in the summer, potentially in August. So. Um, uh, I'll turn over the uh, presentation um, that Shelly has. Thank you, Tracy. And thank you for having us tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to share the screen and you've already had a long night. So I'm going to try to move quickly, but also be as thorough as possible. Um, a lot of you are very familiar with the library issues, but there could be people on River Channel or who watch this later and the information might be helpful to them. So let's see if I can do this. Here we go. And get this moved. All right, is um, everybody seeing the, um, the first slide? Yes, it's coming up. Okay, great. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is funding and the crisis that we're in. And of course, if you've been following um, the library developments over the past um, number of years, this is not a surprise um, or, or a secret. Um, everybody who's been involved knows this has been coming. And um, I would like to give you a little bit of the background, um, where we're at and um, where we are going to have to go uh, forward. Let's see here. Okay. So um, this boils down to uh, a couple of things that we've been talking about that we need to do. We have a position that's been open for over a year. Um, we've made a lot of cuts to various areas of the budget that we would like to at least restore partially. And we have a staff retention and recruitment report that we need to implement. If we were to do all of those things, and our funding levels are the same, we will basically be out of all of our reserves in 14 months and um, making very significant cuts. 
what those cuts entail, um, cutting the materials that people check out, the programs that we run, and actually closing the doors um, one to three days a week, depending on what happens. Now, we can slow this process down by partial implementation of the things I just mentioned, but if we did nothing, if we didn't spend one penny more and our funding stays the same, the reserves will be gone in 2024, and then we will be making those cuts and closing the doors. So how did we get here? Um, the basic uh, history, we know that the city of Hudson, town of Hudson and the village came together in 2003 to create the joint library, St. Joe joined the following year. And the reason for doing this was stated upfront clearly in the agreement and it wasn't to save money it was to substantially increase local library funding and services. And that is written specifically in the agreement that everybody signed. That actually didn't happen. There was a formula that built into the agreement, but it was changed throughout the years to sort of reduce the commitment that the partners would have to make. However, the real hit came in 2012 when it was discovered that the funding law for libraries had been broken for the Hudson Area Public Library. The partners all underfunded by a total of $415,670. That was just one year. That's not the cumulative effect of a number of years. One year, the library lost $415,000. That was a huge hit. And I've been asked many times from people, well, what happened? Was there some um, nefarious behavior going on at the partners? And absolutely not. It was an administrative oversight that was linked to a change in law that came up rather suddenly on how the funding was supposed to be carried out and what law would set the minimums that everybody had to pay. Um, obviously, this came at a tough time in the economy. And at this point, everybody's under levy limits. So the partner's hands were really tied. I mean, this is a huge amount of money. So what happened was the legislature stepped in and they changed the law. Instead of asking the partners to restore the funding and figure out a fix that way, they decided to change the law. The partners did not have to pay that $415,000 and what had happened is this is about the time we went from what we are doing now, the maintenance of effort was a three-year average. They changed it so the municipalities had to meet that county exemption that we're always talking about. And that's where Hudson and all the partners got caught is in that change. Now, if that's the case, you would think, didn't this happen in cities across Wisconsin? They all faced the same change in the law. And actually that wasn't the case for those cities. Most of them were already funding their libraries at or above that county exemption level. That's why we got hit so hard because the base was so low to begin with. So the law changed it back just for joint libraries to the three-year average. And that saved the communities from incredible financial burden. I don't know how any of the communities would have been able to do that. But the three-year average is and has been a disincentive for funding increases for the library because as you know, it bumps up your commitment in future years. And honestly, the library has never recovered from 2012. If we had the funding restored um, at that point in time, and we had received 2% increases every year since then, our budget would be at 1.2 million. And in reality, because of the three-year average, we are at about 747,000 in the municipal funding. Um, I think it's always helpful to see what other uh, municipalities have been doing with their libraries and how we compare. So when we came together as a joint library, we formed the 32nd largest library in the state of Wisconsin. That's under 380 libraries. So we are quite a large library system. Um, it's over 30,000 people are in our service area. 
River Falls, by contrast, um, similar size city, their uh, municipal service area is just over 15,000. And you can see down the line, um, New Richmond um, is the third largest in our county. So Hudson Area Public Library serves one third of St. Croix County's residents. River Falls pays its library $869,000. You can see that the city of Hudson contributes substantially less at 350. And the amounts for the other cities are there in the, the slides. I wanted to add um, just a little bit more detail here quickly because you know River Falls is the most comparable library and comparable community and closest to us. So they get that three, or I'm sorry, $869,000 from the city, but look at their county funding as well. It's almost $400,000. So the result is their budget is 1.2, almost $1.3 million. Our municipal funding, if we added everybody together, the four partners is 724,000, almost 725. Our county funding, if you combine the two is $74,000. So that's, the gap is huge. They're about half a million dollars um, ahead of us in terms of the funding. And we talk about this a lot. I think every time we come to one of your meetings, we talk about the per capita funding. Uh, we are at $23, almost uh, $24. State average is 54. This puts us at um, among the very bottom. 361 of the state's libraries get more per capita funding than, than Hudson. Um, where the money goes, very much like schools or even a police department, our service is provided by people. So the majority of the budget does go to staff salaries. Um, the second largest part of our budget is for our building at almost $150,000. Those are also some of the fixed costs, costs associated with that. And uh, part of our service that we provide not just the books, but we do tons of programming, cultural programming, lifelong learning, teen and tween nights at the library, et cetera. We had 20,000 people come to our programs in 2019 before the, the pandemic. Um, that was a record year for us. It's substantially higher than any library in our area. So we're very proud of that. But you'll notice there was no programming budget in the pie chart that I showed you. And that's because we have no tax dollars for programming. Uh, we get our program funds from the Friends of the Library and the Hudson Area Library Foundation through their book sales and annual campaign. All of our programs are free and they are paid for with those donations. Uh, we cannot use those grant dollars that they give us for programs to put into operations. However, they are not for salaries and they are not for benefits. So we don't use those dollars for any of our operating expenses and they would not allow us to do that. So I do assert and um, have been and will continue to assert that this is not a spending problem. This is truly a funding problem. This is how we've been surviving. We have been taking money out of our collection, the books, audiobooks, CDs, movies, um, and we put it into operations. You can see how much our collection budget has changed over the years. Um, we're down about half in 11 years. We're spending less instead of more. We've done the same with um, technology and staff development dollars. I just mentioned the donations. We've become overly reliant on donations. We did reduce hours. As you know, for a while, we were closed on Mondays. Those were reinstated and actually expanded. And we've been using reserves to cover our operating expenses. Our deficit budget for this year is about $80,000. And, but this is the big one and where we're starting to hit the wall is staffing, understaffing and um, underpaying. The state has standards for libraries. Um, the basic premise is every Wisconsin citizen deserves access to a basic library service. And that is considered a minimum service. They've set out a list of qualitative and quantitative standards in a document which you can find at the DPI's website so there's a minimum level, 
a medium level and a high level of service. Based on our size, a minimum service library would have 17 full-time equivalents. We have 12.5. So we are not even at the level of a minimum service library. So we have kept our staff very lean. The problem we are running into is the wages that we've been paying staff. Our turnover rate has hit, um, it's becoming unmanageable. I have in this presentation that we've lost 17 people in a year and a half, we're at 18 now. Um, the staff that have um, seniority and a lot of skills are spending so much of their time training new people and then opening the door and sending them right back out. Um, and our job postings are not getting applications. The last two librarians that we hired, I had to personally recruit because we did not get applications. Um, the wages, these are from 20. Uh, 2020, our librarians were making $16.86 an hour, and uh, River Falls at the same time was in the 30 range. They're now up to $33 an hour. New Richmond is now at 21 an hour, and the Twin Cities ranges anywhere from 25 and the very low end to $40 an hour. So this has been a huge problem. Our librarians have degrees and experience, and we cannot keep them. We are Unfortunately or unfortunately, however you want to look at it, just a few miles from the Twin Cities, that opens the door for so many people in our community for where they want to work. And it puts us in a competitive position with those libraries, as well as our neighbors. Bayport uh, Library recently hired front desk clerk for $19 an hour, which is more than what our librarians make. And they are the closest library to us. Not River Falls, not Roberts, Bayport. So that staff retention and recruitment report proposes that librarians go to $25 an hour in 2021. Um, our board has um, in, endorsed and embraced this report and they know it needs to be done. Also that we cannot do it right now. They did move salaries to $18.50 an hour this year and also adopted our first ever PTO plan, which was a huge, um, benefit for our staff that they've never had before. Uh, actually, in 2019, the director was the only person who got any paid sick time. So um, staff is very grateful that they're making movements in that direction. So our goal is to try to be at the services we were providing in 2019 and do some of that implementation of that staff retention report that I just mentioned, as well as uh, reinstating at least partially some of the cuts we've made to the collection, et cetera. And the cost of that is $1.18 million. Our current budget is $910,000, and that is with us using $80,000 from the reserves. So you can see we are a long ways off from that. If we were to do everything that I laid out to the fullest extent, we'd be talking about a 48% increase in our municipal funding, which is huge. If you're gasping, I get it. That is a huge number. 30% gets us partially there. And that is what some of the community leaders have sort of looked at and settled on is that 30%. It's been discussed at um, the city um, and the town of St. Joe. And I recently presented also at the town of Hudson. Nobody has made any decisions. Nobody has done any voting. Um, and I'm not sure how all of this is gonna play out, but the conversations are happening. Um, just in terms of return on investment, the savings that the library has generated, um, if people who checked out materials actually had paid for them, this is what they would have paid over $3.8 million in these four communities. So you can look for um, North Hudson, the purple bar, to see what the funding was and then what people saved who checked out materials from the library. And then this is one that we've talked about before and you've seen many times by not having to meet that county tax exemption level this is what the savings has been on a five-year period from 15 to 2019. 
And for North Hudson, that's 126, almost $127,000 in tax savings for your taxpayers. So um, we are grateful that we've been able to produce a lot of savings to people in the communities and still offer them really good quality library, but we're hitting the wall. And what we're going to be asking is that the communities um, return some of the savings their taxpayers get back to the library so we can continue to be a successful and functional joint library. Um, data about the value of libraries, I, I am gonna keep moving because you might have questions and I know you have other things on your agenda. Um, also, uh, libraries are not just books. Books are just the beginning. And I hope you'll have a chance to look at this presentation and see some of the other things that happen at the library. And then as Tracy mentioned, we have our stakeholder retreat. The purpose of that is to bring you, um, the other communities, but also the chamber, business people, um, patrons, other opinion leaders in our communities all together and talk about what kind of library do we want this community to have and how do we pay for it? And that's gonna give us the groundwork we need to move forward um, in a way that we know that the community um, will support and get us to where we need to be, hopefully without being too burdensome to our taxpayers, because we want to do both. We want to be a good steward of the resources you've provided for us, but also give them the, the library that they want and the library that they deserve. So I did go pretty quickly, probably not quick enough, but I appreciate the time and I would love to take any questions um, and I'll take notes on any information that you might want me to bring back at another time. There. Stan, so Kelly, if you're talking, you're on mute. Sorry oh. about that. Uh, I know, I thank you, uh, Shelly, for the presentation. Uh, I know we've talked several times and uh, and you're well aware of our concerns. I know that's a lot of information for the board and everything uh, to uh, digest, and especially our new folks. I don't know how much they've had a chance to follow this up. And again, uh, this is a preliminary, uh, which is, I, I appreciate you getting out ahead of the, the pack and wanting, uh, you know, taxpayer dollars. I mean, it's, uh, that's what this is actually all about, you know, and what we can afford and, and it, uh, we'll be discussing when budget comes up in a, you know, unfortunately a few months that we have to deal with, but anybody have any questions for, uh, Shelly and, uh, thank you, Tracy, for your service on the board for sure. But, uh, have we got anything? I would no, just thank like you. to ask if that presentation is on the website. Is that where we'd be able to see it? I don't think that's in our packet. Um, this, um, I can make sure, first of all, that Melissa gets that in the packet. I'll compress the file. It's a very large file. Um, so I'll send that to you. Um, also, it is going on our website. I have... Um, an interview on River Channel with Meg Heaton, where we discussed this and she asked a lot of questions. We put up some of the charts. Um, you might find that helpful. It's been watched by almost 500 people, which tells me there's a lot of interest in the topic. And I Can believe- repeat her name, please? Meg Heaton, she's with Western Wisconsin Journal. Okay, thank you. Yep, and that's on River Channel. And this meeting, as well as my presentation to um, the city of Hudson, there also should be on River Channel. Thank you very much. And this will be on River Channel also. Right. Okay. Thank you, ladies, for uh, joining us. Uh, and again, apologize. For, usually uh, when you're that high on the agenda, it doesn't uh, take this long to get there. But uh, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on in the village. And, uh, and right. you know, you have a blessed evening. And we'll uh, head on to our next uh, agenda item. Thank you, Stan. Thank you, everybody. You, uh, item eight, uh, resolution 20, 20 or 2021 03 support for a strong state and local partnership. Uh, this is a resolution that, uh, the league of municipalities, which is this, you know, the cities and the villages around the state, uh, we've, uh, 
that we have depended on for years, shared revenue. That's where the state gives everybody so much money. And, uh, and lately, you know, I'll just read the resolution. We're going, we're going way over time tonight anyway, so this is going to be quick, but it gives you good background information on actually what uh, this is about. So, you know, I mean, uh, it's, uh, you know, and I'll go with the, starting with the whereas. For over 90 years, the state shared revenue program has been a key component of Wisconsin state and local relationships and they're an important part of the state overall program of property tax relief. Whereas over the last 20 years, shared revenue for funding for the municipalities has been cut by $94 million. Whereas over the last generation, property taxes have grown as the share of city village revenues has shared, as shared with the other state aid, Wisconsin municipalities has lagged. And whereas the state aid provided by a larger share of municipal revenues in Wisconsin than the property taxes from 1975 to 1997. That's where, you know, that's when we started hitting, getting hit with the heavy property. Today, property taxes account for more than twice as much than municipal revenue as state aid. And then whereas to create and maintain quality communities that attract businesses and families, municipalities must invest in services and infrastructure that people and businesses expect, like police protection, fire suppression, road maintenance, snow plowing, libraries, and parks. And whereas the state should reinvest a portion of its sales and income tax revenue growth to local communities to spur further economic growth and make Wisconsin communities places where people want to live and work. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the village of North Hudson calls on the legislature to pass a state budget increasing funding for the shared revenue programs and direct the clerk to send a copy of this resolution to the state legislators representing the village of North Hudson and to Governor Tony Evers and to the League and Municipality. And if it is approved, I will uh, sign this and we will send it on to the state. This has uh, been a huge content piece of con uh, issues for uh, years now. And, you know, we've dropped a considerable amount of money uh, we, you know, it's, uh, it be, you know, it'll be a help for us, you know, with our property taxes, if we, uh, if we can get this through and I'm not, you know, it's a resolution. It's a suggestion to the state. And we know how those guys have a tendency to maybe not listen or they might listen, but they might not hear it. So, uh, any discussion on this? I uh, do need to approve. Thank you. And I'll second number 2021 dash Oh three. Thank you, Thank Brian. you, Brian. Thank you, I'll, Tim. I got a little ahead of myself. I'll second there. it. Yep, I was going to go second. But thank you, Brian. I do the speed run, you know that because uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're having a, a night. So, uh, okay. So, any further discussion? Hearing none. Uh, all in favor of the resolution? This doesn't cost us anything or anything like that. It just lets the state know that hey, we'd like a little help, Amy. Can I ask a quick question? Is this part sure. of a bigger movement with other communities as well, or is this something we're doing on our own? Oh, no, this is this is all across the state. The League of Municipalities, I think it, Melissa is probably, you, you know, I, I think she said you guys signed up for uh, uh, Local Government 101. Yes. That, coming that's up. A, they're a very great, they're, our, they're basically our lobbying group. And, you know, they talk to the legislatures. I know... Uh, before they locked Madison down, I would go down and meet with the legislatures uh, through the league. Uh, they're very, Great. very. I good kind of assume that, but I just wanted to make sure being new. Thanks. Yeah. No, yeah, no this problem. Resolution, this resolution was a template that the league had sent out asking municipalities to adopt it. Super. Okay. So, uh, all in favor of the resolution, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Excellent. Okay, Melissa, and we'll sign that, and you can get it sent on. I'll be done uh, sometime tomorrow or Thursday. Uh, okay, next on the agenda is uh, new business from the board or staff. Uh, president's comments are first. Uh, let's see, the month of May is Military Appreciation Month. It's uh, a time uh, where, which also includes Memorial Day, uh, where we uh, salute our, our fallen soldiers and our veterans that have uh, help keep our country free in, uh, with liberty. And I hope everyone will remember that. I know uh, Hudson always has a very nice uh, presentation uh, uh, program on uh, 
Memorial Day. So I hope we will uh, to see you there. Uh, the next item is uh, it's fast approaching, and I hope everybody's paid attention. It's uh, Mother's Day on Sunday, and I really hope uh, that all the mothers out there and everyone has a very safe and wonderful Mother's Day. We thank the mothers of this country. They are the backbone of uh, what we do. And next, the, the we had an earlier road project discussion, and I would just like to let everyone know that our website is right in the top banner that you can click there and everything that we get from those guys we put on there. Melissa's done a great job on that. And uh, we want to make sure that you're, if you want to keep up to date and please, please, please tell everyone that, you know, that uh, you know, that has questions to go there because uh, you know, it is a great source and the best information we have. And let's see next. Uh, I, uh, well, I'm just going to say it now because, uh, uh, like we, we've had issues with these, uh, 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 the zooms and everything like that. I would like to, you know, just to the board, uh, I hope you'd be thinking about maybe possibly returning to the boardroom. And, uh, we put in a, uh, we were fortunate enough to get money from the government to have a very nice, uh, uh, air purifier that we've, uh, put in the boardroom. We've got it all cleaned and sanitized. We've run numerous elections through there and uh, haven't had issues. We have uh, chairs that we can wipe down and everything like that. So please consider, uh, you know, I would like to see us return to the board uh, room as, as soon as possible. And finally, if there are any of you that are still entertaining the idea, I still have room for one person on the board of review. And uh, Melissa and I uh, sat through or suffered through the training that we have to do every once in a while. So you do not have to take the class or anything like that. And, uh, we would, uh, you know, so it's, uh, and again, uh, in, uh, all my, uh, in like eight years that I've been here, uh, we've been, uh, our, uh, assessor is taking care of it and we have not had any, uh, contentions or have need for the other than this required by the state. So, uh, with that, Melissa, Okay, I just wanted to touch on the American Rescue Plan Act. I'm just doing a quick summary on it. As you may be aware, the American Rescue Plan Act was signed into law on March 11th, 2021. I've attended a few webinars on this topic and will, be, and will continue gathering information. The funds are based on population and the village of North Hudson is expected to receive about $376,000. The funds will pass through from the state to the local municipalities in two equal payments. The first will be about 90 days from enactment. The second will come one year after the dis disbursement of the first payment. There are specific allowable uses for these funds and there are still many questions that need to be answered. The National League of Cities is still researching to get answers from the US Treasury, but do, ex uh, but do not expect answers until around May 11th or 60 days after the act was signed. <clears throat> municipalities have until December 31st, 2024 to spend these funds or any remaining needs to be returned. So there is time to slow down and really think about how these funds should and can be used. Once more guidance comes out from the U.S. Treasury, village staff will put together more information and options for the village board to discuss a strategic approach to utilize these funds. Thank you. That's Thank all I got. Okay. So we can go on to item 10. Plan commission recommendations, chair update. I don't see Mike, so I'm guessing Paul's got the ball. Well, Stan, the, uh, the major item was the conditional use permit for the, uh, um, the fireworks stop um, exit, exit one, I believe it's called. Uh, there was quite a bit of discussion uh, ultimately, Plan Commission recommended approval. Their concerns, I think, were twofold. One was uh, the position of the sign in terms of impact on neighbors, whether the sign was going to be, this is a electronic sign. It's not a, a standard, you know, painted sign. This is electronic, like a TV. Um, you know, the flashing lights, the, uh, the change in the text, that sort of thing. The other was, you know, it can only, it should only advertise 
the fireworks business. It can't be essentially a billboard for other businesses. Uh, and I guess I would like to point out one item that's in your code is that you know the sign requirements under the code prohibit signs that are flashing or have intermittent lights or have moving lights uh, other than for time temp and community events. So, you know, that language I think was in there pre this type of sign. Uh, but I think it's something to consider and I, and I think the board can, can approve this maybe with some information from the applicant just as to what they expect in terms of the refresh rate on the sign. Uh, so it's not just flashing, flashing, flashing out there as opposed to, you know, changing a message every few minutes. The, the plan commission recommended approval. Thank you, Paul. Any and I move questions? to approve the conditional use permit for exit one fireworks. Thank you, Brian. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Phil. Now discussion. So how much different is this sign than say the village sign or the sign that uh, quick trip has that does some flashing? Are you, uh, Paul, are you saying that it's going to be worse than those or what? No. And, and the applicant wasn't you know, real specific as to, you know, the refresh rate and those things. Uh, maybe the ordinance itself needs to be looked at and modernized a little bit. <laughs> it sounds like it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, these things didn't exist a few years ago. You know, this is—it's right. going to be a high-quality sign. Uh, yeah, sure it looks like it. A job. It's a yeah. nice—it's a good picture of it down here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, okay. Uh, that. Oops. Okay. I thought I—I I keep hearing some background noise every once in a while. Uh, well, hearing uh, no other questions or comments, uh, this is no spending on our part. So all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Item 11, personal and finance committee recommendations, claims approval. Uh, Stan, can I move to approve the board or can I move to have the board approve the May the 4th 2021 non-recurring claims of $54,025.08. Thank you, Kirk. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Brian. Discussion? Hearing none, we've got to have a, let's see, this has got to be a spending issue. So, Bill? Yes. Mary? Yes. Kirk? Yes. Amy? Yes. Brian? Yes. Tim? Yes. And I'll make it unanimous. Yes. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, next on the ag agenda is uh, Public Works Committee Chair Update. Brian, you got the ball. Uh, Stan, we did meet, and we have a couple things to bring forward. We are recommending to, to rent a spray patch trailer from RCM Equipment, also to purchase trap rock and oil, possibly from another vendor to be determined at a later date, cost not to exceed 30,000 and to be paid for from the hot patch slash spray patch street maintenance account. Second. Thank you, bro. Thank you, Phil. So uh, it is a budgeted item. And basic, just to sum it up, basically, we've been using um, a, a, another uh, contractor at 4,500 a day for spray patching and Public Works wants to try and do it themselves this year. Uh, Patrick, uh, anything to add? I, I'm guessing that, you know, being from our earlier discussion at finance, uh, this, you can rent this. It, it looks like a, a higher number, but you get to use the, the unit for the whole month where the 4,500 was per day. Yes. And just so that you're, uh, just so that I'm not misleading anyone, the 4,500 a day, um, that included the oil and the rock. This right. this does not. Uh, well, I'll have to purchase that separately. So I don't want to. I want to be open and honest with everyone. I'm 
I'm not saying that this is definitely a, a bit of uh, a much better deal. I'm hoping to at least break even if nothing else, but I'd like to just for the convenience of having it here um, and then giving it a shot to see what we can do with it um, and then do the repairs on our time. And then maybe possibly by having that for a whole month, we won't have to race like uh, the, the previous folks did to get it in before the rain that wasn't supposed to come and then wash it into the gutter. <laughs> Correct. And I, I think uh, to me, it was, uh, you know, and the finance committee uh, very much approved of it. So uh, any other questions or discussion? Yes. Hearing none, all in favor of the, oh, wait a minute, spending. Uh, let's go. I'll say yes, Tim. Yes. Brian. Yes. Uh, Amy. Yes. Kirk. Yes. Mary. Yes. And Phil. Yes. Thank you, Brian. You got uh, one more Bobcat. Yep. Um, we are uh, recommending to the skid loader trade in and upgrade with fabric, fabric caterpillar with cost not to exceed 14,700 funding to come from public works, capital equipment fund. Thank Second. you, Brian. And thank you, Phil. Uh, discussion? Here no questions. Not. <laughs> okay. No questions, comments? Okay. Hearing none, we'll go back to the back order again. Phil? Yes. Mary? Yes. Kirk? Yes. Amy? Yes. Brian? Yes. Tim? Yes. And yes, I think everybody's getting tired. Nobody's used to running this kind of late meetings to this group, I'm <laughs> sure. But uh, it, uh, we're plowing through her. And next on the agenda is uh, is uh, public safety. And we have Tim. Uh, Stan, we did meet. Uh, and we do have one thing to carry forward. But for first of all, item B. We are postponing this until the next meetings for uh, for more discussion between the chief and I on some of the activities on on the uh, street closures. So, um, well, we won't go over that tonight. But item C is going to be the adoption of Ordinance 01-2021, designating and adopting alternate travel routes during a Highway 35 project discussion mm -hmm. and possible approval. So the motion on the line would basically, I'm going to read the first paragraph and then we'll detail out the other activities um, despite this and the fact that those are those are called out. The Village Board of, of the Village of North Hudson, Wisconsin, hereby designates and adopts the following alternate travel routes and parking regulations through the village during the reconstruction of Highway 35 to ensure people, construction equipment, and public safety vehicles can safely travel to, from, and within the village. In the event of any provisions of this ordinance conflicts with any existing ordinance of the village, including but not limited to parking reg regulations, the provisions of this ordinance shall supersede and control during the period of this ordinance as in effect. And we list a total of nine identifiable items that are called on how we would uh, manage this type of ordinance. Uh, one second, Tim. Uh, I will <laughs> second that first part. I just want to yeah, detail that out as far as, okay. I mean, then we could talk about it after, I think. Yeah. <clears throat> Keep going. Well, um, what I want to say is ordinance shall commence on Wednesday, May 5th. That's why I wasn't done quite yet with the curve, but uh, <laughs> May 5th on 2021 and automatically terminate and cease to effect without further actions by the village board upon completion of the highway 35 reconstruction project or such early time as deemed by the board. Can I just make one Point of clarification there. Um, it's actually going to be, be enforceable when it's published. Um, I think maybe the May 5th date in there got in there because uh, it was going to be enacted a little bit sooner. But as soon as it gets published, adopted, and then published, it'll be effective. Very good. Thank you. And in the interim, I can request Public Works to sign it as by order of the police department. So we will be able to enforce this starting tomorrow. It'll just be in, co or in code starting when it's published. Yeah, because, uh, yeah, the tra travel has been a little confused uh, 
so far, but uh, not, I guess not too bad, but I think it'll get, uh, people get used to it. Okay. So that's, uh, let's see, there's no spending involved in that one. Uh, if there's no further discussion. Oh, Martin? yeah, we got discussions quick. Oh, Sam. Okay, Tim. Uh, you want to go chief first or. Yeah, if you don't mind. Uh, one yep. thing that um, after this passed through the public safety committee uh, kind of kept coming up and um, I did some research or just by actually traveling the route, um, the area between North End Road and Monroe Street on 4th Street North is is quite wide and it's actually, I don't know if it was designed or engineered to be an alternate route for Highway 35 if there were a closure, but it definitely can take on uh, a lot more traffic, both northbound and southbound, as far as passing and allowing for potentially one side to still have parking. I know that there's some residents from 6th Street who are talking about utilizing that as their alternate parking location and getting permissions to you know walk through their neighbor's yard versus trying to park on one of the side streets. Um, and so I guess if the if the maker of the motion would consider changing uh, the verbiage in number three to basically say parking will be prohibited on 4th Street North from North End Road North to Monroe Street North on the north side, or I'm sorry, on the east side, and then uh, on 4th Street North on both sides from Monroe Street North to Wisconsin Street North. That's where it narrows down considerably. Um, I'm getting some feedback from residents and from the, the Bible Baptist Church and some of those that may have some limited access. And I, and I believe that it would be possible to allow the the no, or the parking to still be on the west side limit or prohibit it on the east side and then um, you know if need be if that's a problem we could definitely bring them back to the board and, and make that change so that's my first point so move for adjustment on that um, second agree second okay. well I'm not sure I followed all that, Chief, but so you're saying from Summer Street down to Monroe Street, you're going to allow uh, both sides or one no. side? No. One side. What I just Neither described side. was actually from North End Road, where, where North End Road turns into 4th Street North. From there all the way down Monroe, only allow parking on the west side of the street, but still restrict parking on the east side. There will be no parking on the east side. Does that clarify okay. it for you? Yeah. Okay. And then from and then from Monroe from Monroe down to Wisconsin, what's it look like? No parking on either no side parking. because it's Okay, very great. Area. Great. Um there was some discussion today about uh uh which side on uh, number 5 here, which side of Wisconsin Street to have the the no parking, but I understand there's a vision there's a vision problem down there anyway when people are parking on the north side right in front of Stars Bar. Yeah, I was not part of that conversation, so I don't know what it entailed. But yes, I think coming from the intersection near Stars as you're heading south um, to have parking on the north side with the potential for the increased volume would be better to have no parking on the north side so there's a line of sight for people turning from there. Okay, so I'm okay with that. I just, Chief, how do we... That, that intersection has been a problem with people parking in front of stars to be able to actually see people coming from Galahad, uh, you know, going towards uh, 6th Street. How do we get a longer or a, a yellow line on a curb? I've never had the chance to ask you that. To, you I, know, think, not, I don't think that fits within this agenda item, but definitely something that we could discuss. Uh, it would just be an act of the board to designate that area as no parking for a certain okay. Thank you. And one other chief, one other item that brought up um, is around signage and um, it, it is more, it wasn't on a no parking side. It was more on, on a detour type signage. And I, I think I felt yeah, that. I appreciate that. that Tim. I know you and I yeah. talked earlier and, and right <clears throat> now um, Patrick and I attend the weekly construction meetings on Monday mornings to discuss concerns, problems, areas that we're trying to, to make flow better um, communication between the public and DOT uh, a lot of different things. And so I, I have a couple of bullet points just to discuss. I know there's a lot of talk on social media about the fact that there are no local detour signs that are being placed within the village to try to get around the construction zone. Um, the, the thought behind that uh, or the decision by the DOT to designate the, the detour being through Minnesota 
um, has a lot of different factors to it. But the one for that I want to bring forward for the village's perspective is, on average, I, the last traffic study I saw, there's 12,000 cars that cross the Malu Bridge on a daily basis. And so if we were to do a local detour, basically what we would be saying is we're allowing all those 12,000 vehicles to come into the village and then go through some side street. The DOT's perspective is this is a local, close to local traffic only, meaning that we only want to have the limited amount of traffic that we can traveling through some of these side streets and, uh, and back and forth. And so that's why uh, I've stayed in the position agreeing with the idea that there shouldn't be uh, local detour signage put up because again, there's a couple of different things. There's those different segments that he talked about uh, like feels like three hours ago now. Um, and it, uh, you know, those two and a half segments that we have that will change the biggest one that we're going to have a problem with is really the segment that's around the Malu Bridge, because at the time that that part is closed, the only access into the village of North Hudson will be across the bridge, one lane traffic, turning on South Street, and then getting over to 7th Street and moving from there. And so there's to put 12,000 people or vehicles on South Street into one lane traffic on the bridge, we really want to encourage the use of the detour route into Minnesota and to limit the amount of traffic into our residential areas and those types of things. Now, we're on day two. I realized that people yesterday were completely frustrated. I was as well, just trying to get around and do certain things and answer questions, but we are on day two. In the conversations that we had on Monday with the city of Hudson uh, personnel is that their volumes have reduced significantly through their residential areas because people have now picked up the construction perspective. They've chosen alternate routes. Um, and so the intent of this ordinance is really to allow for our local residents to have um, some local routes. Now, one thing that I did see today, and I, I talked to Melissa about just before the meeting, is that there are some signs that have, have been put up um, that are, are being, uh, at least at the bottom, talk about the fact that they're part of the committee uh, that was put together basically to keep the businesses uh, active and, and you know, people coming to and from. Um, I really appreciated whoever came up with that idea. Um, and, and I think it's something that we definitely want to encourage is obviously business travel or, and, and uh, activities. Two things come to mind. One, whoever designed the path, I would have preferred that they would have talked to me and we could have gotten those people onto 4th Street North instead of through like six different turns through the residential area on the east side. Um, and so with that being said, there is part of our ordinance that signage cannot go up unless it is uh, under 98-102 parent B, parent 6, uh, I think is something that we can use as a part of our ordinance to, to basically allow for that organization as a local civil um, organization to be able to put those signs in place to as assist with getting people to our businesses. And I, I really appreciate the idea behind it. Um, and that would just need to be approved by the village clerk. So it wouldn't have to be the board. It could just be a conversation with the village clerk so that we know where those signs would be going and to encourage people to come to our businesses. But in my perspective as the public safety person is to make sure that we get them there safely and not necessarily through our uh, more of the residential area where 4th Street, again, is somewhat designed for uh, that type of traffic flow and, and volume. Um, I think that was most of what, um, what I wanted to kind of talk about prior to this ordinance, you know, the consideration of the ordinance, because we do have um, a number of items that are listed there. I'm going to share my screen and pop up really quick the map that um, was on as part of the information, just so that I can help maybe visualize because I'm a visual person. We have a number of residents on 6th Street North that will have periods of time where they will not be able to, to access their properties while the construction is going on. So this ordinance in number eight, uh, right now we currently have a 24 hour parking ordinance where you cannot store your vehicle on the street for longer than 24 hours at a time. This particular ordinance would lift that restriction for these areas that are kind of the light green here. Um, to be able to, or for people to be able to pull down into these areas, park and leave their vehicles for periods of time. We obviously will increase patrol in those areas to make sure that we can try to help with securing those uh, vehicles that might be there. The contractor did say that these areas uh, will be accessible in the evenings. Now I know he had said 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. previously. If they do extend their work time until 9 p.m., 
I don't know how that will change and I'll have to discuss that with him at the seven or at the uh, meeting on Monday. Um, but those green areas are the ones that are bullet pointed for the locations and the blocks where we would not um, enforce the 24 hour ordinance uh, in lieu of the current um, project that's going on. And then the red lines are basically just that that free flow with, with you know, only a couple of turns uh, going through areas that are somewhat used to having some higher flow traffic uh, during Pepperfest for the parade detailed uh, detour and those types of things historically. And uh, they do have some um, access to Stars Bar, uh, the business area here, as well as the business area on the north end. So I think instead of sending them through this residential area on the east side currently, uh, to try to make it a little bit more smooth flowing to take them that way. And so that's where some of the parking prohibitions go into place. Um, and I think that was most of what I wanted to point out. Is there anyone that has questions about this map? Otherwise I can take it down. Well, thank you, chief. That was very uh, good to point out. And, uh, I just want to say that that the the signs that we have made are much nicer than the ones in Hudson, and uh, and and I think you know, it, it takes one more sign that we you know put it down there at uh, Wisconsin Street, but you know aim in the other direction. You know we can change the one that's up on uh, where is it St. Croix and uh, in Seventh, I think it is. But uh, no, I mean it's it's uh, it in. in I was surprised when I've been at the village hall, the amount of traffic that, uh, you know, comes pouring past the village hall is like, holy cow. And, uh, but you know, that's the majority of the residents live on that side. So we're all pouring down that direction in order to get to where we've got to go down South. But, uh, no, that was very good. Uh, and, uh, and I, I'm pretty sure it'd be easy enough to, uh, make sure we direct them down to fourth street. So it's and just the way they, well, that's what bring up, and, and Tim had brought this up earlier and I apologize to interrupt, but um, there was some conversation about truck traffic. Um, that would be one of the other reasons that, uh, you know, if there was some direction down there, the, the I guess the point that I'm about to make is that currently the signage on the north end of the village is no through trucks. Um, we've worked, uh, Melissa worked with the owner of um, the 1880 storage to try to determine their routes and they're coming in from the north end now. They are no longer going south and so that's going to be an enforcement issue uh we're day two again of this headache um and so it could just be that my officers will start to to enforce the no trucks will make stops have conversations with the the drivers and then of course encourage their ownership to um if there are future deliveries to to come from the north instead of trying to utilize utilizing the bridge and coming in through those south uh directions excellent yeah i followed so, an 18 wheeler through hudson coming north on third street and that is a not a good place to put that big a truck i'll guarantee you that so Brian. i'm getting plenty of complaints about the no detour signs just so you know um even i mean even from our own residents uh who did you talk to in hudson chief that said uh you know after a week or so things got better because i talked to people on third street over there where their main uh, detour is, uh, going North and third street is hopping mad and they're not seeing any decrease. And that is as of yesterday. And I don't know what, again, it could be perception, uh, but the, the, it was the public works director, the, uh, engineer, uh, there were a number of them and they were getting the same types of complaints. But I think, um, the conversation was that the number that started on day one to the number that was there day seven, had, re had reduced. Now that doesn't mean that the speeds aren't, you know, I, I heard a lot of conversation about the speeds through that area and the fact that it's not signed 25 because of course it's a residential area. And so therefore it's implied. Um, and then again, that just partially becomes an enforcement issue where we have to just inundate that area with some law enforcement to try to slow people down, educate people. Um, that's not always the, the perfect fix by any means, but Again, we're in day two, and I think it's just going to take some time for people to figure out the easiest route to get around and or out of the village. So you you really don't think we need to have a use four street sign somewhere up there? Uh, I don't even know how to word that sign. And that's but... the problem. And that's really the problem because it's not a detour. It's an alternate route for our local traffic. Um, and, and I think is the more that the public gets educated and the more that 
they see the no parking signs, hopefully. And, and again, it, it may just be one of those business signs that, you know, business access might be a nice way to say, hey, yeah. you can still go this way, but, you know, not, uh, not necessarily encourage 12,000 cars to go down 4th Street and try to cross the bridge. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Hearing none. Uh, they go vote and everybody gets to participate in all in favor of the ordinance as stated. Signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, next, public welfare. Kirk, did you guys meet? We did not. Okay, how about the park board? <clears throat> we did meet, and we have one action to bring. Uh, I recommended the purchase of livestock fencing and material from the funds to come from the park department fund a price not to exceed $1,400. Thank you, Kurt. Is there a second? Second. second. Everybody wants to get them goats here munching. I, I like that. I love yeah. it. Uh, I'll give a quick update. We're looking to see if we can get goats to take out our buckthorn. Uh, this is the first step to get the material. After that, we'll bring in the goats, and we're really hoping that this could expand, expand, expand. Oof, tired. Expand. Uh, this, thank you. Uh, our parks, and uh, we've done a pretty good amount of research about this, so we're really hoping that this could clear it out, one to two runs, and this is the first step of it. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I'm very curious about this, and I think, you know, it's it, it, if you want to talk, you're uh, uh, environmentally friendly. I mean, we're we're all about that here. So, I mean, uh, that it should be an interesting deal. Uh, any other comments or questions? Yeah, just uh, one more. This is just another good example of the ideas and stuff that PG and the whole Melissa and the whole group comes up with. Uh, I mean, I really hope it works, and I'm excited for it. So, well, all we have to do is water them, right? PJ or Patrick. <laughs> Stop doing that. <laughs> might, yeah, water and maybe a little bit of feed, but they're pretty uh, pretty low maintenance. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Provides okay, a lot of it. entertainment for the families too. My my uh, son's got this in his subdivision. <laughs> well, no, that you know it'd be good educational for him too. You know, I mean, I, I think it'll be a good draw. People have. We yeah, just don't want them to here. feed them goats. We want them goats munching on other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that sounds good. Well, uh, since we're going to spend some money here, uh, how about Phil? Yes. Mary? Yes. Kirk? <clears throat> yes. Amy? Yes. Brian? Yes. Tim? Yes. And I'll also say yes. Okay, that should be enough of the roll call voting for today. Uh, and it is. And the next item on the agenda is the board may convene into closed session pursuant to statute 19.85 parent one parent lowercase e to deliberate or negotiate the purchase of public properties, investing public funds, or conducting other specific public business whenever competitive or bargaining reasons require a closed session with respect to water and sewer ad hoc committee updates. And so, uh, Chief, thank you. Kevin, I don't think got to be here anymore. I'll stand all second. Thank you. Uh, anybody, let's see, I think everybody else is, I don't know, we got to get rid of Beck on or yeah, vote on it as well. We have to vote on, oh, God, yeah. oh, there's always that vote. Uh, okay, all in favor of going into closed session, signify saying aye. 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 Opposed? Hey, it's 9.15. This is well past my bedtime. So, okay, good thank night, Chief. You, Chief. And thank you for the reminder, as per usual. And let's see, so we've got all board members. I don't know. Nate, can you knock off... Uh... The extras there. You don't think Nate. I think they're disappeared though. And okay, Nate's gone also. Yep. <laughs> and let me pause the recording. Brian, you got the ball? 
Yeah, I do. Hang on a sec. 